statement, and then we'll go right to the questions. Well, we're, uh, we're excited about getting our last practice in here today and doing some shooting drills out here on the court, and then we're going to go get another workout in at another facility. So uh, our, our guys are anxious to play and uh, get the ball tipped up. All right, here we go, right here. Paula Bo of Arizona Republic. And Bo, a lot of coaches burn out over years of coaching, and I wonder what, why you've been able to endure, and, and do you have any time for a hobby anymore? Medication. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, meditation, excuse me. Um, yeah, golf is a hobby. Um, that's about it. A lot of, I've been involved in raising a lot of money through golf outings. Uh, but that would be the one thing, and uh, we, we got a place in PGA West. What else do you do at PGA West? So, yeah, golf is, uh, is my hobby. Right over here, Jim. Uh, Bo, just, you know, these four coaches that are here this time, they've had so much success, and they, uh, the other guys have all been to so many Final Fours. Can you talk about, this is your second Final Four, but with the Division Three championships in the Final Fours, what's the comparison of having a Division Three Final Four to this Final Four, and what have you had to do differently? Well, I love the article today about uh, Evansville going undefeated when they were classified as Division Two back in the 60s when I was in college, 65 to 69. Uh, there were only two levels, and then also NAIA. Um, so at Platteville, and, and it was a nice article about another team that went undefeated even though they weren't listed as Division I then. So our two Platteville teams in Division Three in 95 and 98 going undefeated. I, I, I get so many text messages and calls from the players that played on those teams and say, aren't those people smart enough to know that there's been other undefeated teams in men's basketball? And I don't, I don't text back, no, they're not smart enough. I text back and say they don't feel it's relevant um, in this Division I environment. But if you're asking what it's like to go through a perfect season, uh, I, I, I just always thought it was pretty neat because our practices were always great. And we actually got better during the year. And John and I talked about this. Um, that it becomes so competitive because you don't want you don't have 19 and 0 and then uh oh that 20th one, so each practice leading to each game was really pretty good. And what I noticed was we were getting better um, as the season went along, more so than maybe in some other seasons. Back here, Bo. I know when you came to Madison 2001, you were confident that you were ready, but could you have predicted this level of success? Well, you're talking about a program that's been successful, not, not a head coach necessarily, but I guess if you're unsuccessful, you get that label too. You get the other end of the stick. Um, you know, good people can make good things happen, and boy, I've been surrounded by a lot, uh, from the administration to the players, coaches, support staff. Wisconsin is a pretty neat place, um, and I've had a chance to coach all different kinds of personalities, all different kinds of uh, guys from different walks of life. Um, I'm, I'm really lucky, but I, I didn't say in 2001 when I came in, one thing I said in the press conference when asked, well, what, what do you expect to do here as a head coach? Compete for the upper half of the Big Ten every year, finish towards the top, have a chance for a conference championship, and have a chance to play in the NCAA tournament every year. Okay, so I got lucky in that, in that statement. <laughs> but it, it's been a lot of fun, and it's due to a lot of people. Back here. Josh Katzenstein, Detroit News. Bo, why do you think uh, Kaminsky has been so successful at limiting fouls, and how difficult do you expect it to be for him to stay clean tomorrow? Well, he plays with his feet. Um, more so than a lot of other seven-footers I've seen. He doesn't reach in, and he doesn't try to block every shot. Uh, in the 30 years or whatever that I've been a head coach, 
I would guarantee you that my teams have had the fewest number of block shots of any other team in the country. If you take Platteville, Milwaukee, and Wisconsin, uh, we, we try to keep our feet on the ground. We try to chest up with our hands straight up. We try to do that in the post. Well, you mentioned Frank. That's why I'm talking about post defense. So that's how we try to play, and that's how we teach in our drills. And Frank is an excellent student of the game. Right here. Taylor Zarzer, Sirius XM. I want to go back to your preparation at every level. When were you the most nervous as a head coach in a semifinal or final setting? Was it in high, a high school uh, game, or was it, wow. was it Platteville, or was it maybe last year? I'll tell you. In 1965, first game at the Palestra, Pennsylvania State Tournament. We're like 20-some and 0. And I always led the team out with the first basketball for warm-ups. And what I would do is I would throw the ball off the backboard. The guy behind me would tip the ball, tip, 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 until the last guy who would do either a 360, you could dunk in 1965 in warm-ups. And then we would put on a little dunking uh, show for the other teams. And we would always know when we had the other team defeated when they watched our warm-ups at Chester because everybody was throwing them down in different ways. And we'd always look to see if the other guys were looking. So that was our pregame routine. I started to dribble the ball out of the tunnel. And there's 9,000 in the palestra, whatever. And I never real. I was there for games as a kid, watching Villanova and St. Joe's. The noise level was so high, I almost had a turnover. And you know how I am about turnovers. I thought I was going to miss the backboard when I tossed it up. I'm, I'm thinking, hit the backboard. That is a true story, and I was sweating missing the backboard. Want well, to know what's neat about it is when I hit the backboard, it was over. Every, like, okay, then you go to the other line, and you do your thing, and then you're doing your layups. And uh, so that is the most nervous in any contest. Coaching-wise, I always go into the minds of the players. I don't – it doesn't affect me, whether it's a Division three crowd, a – High school crowd are now Division I on this stage. I, I couldn't tell you where anybody was sitting in Dallas last year. I had no, once you get in there and you start going through your routine, but the most nervous was as a player hoping to hit the backboard. Right here? Nobody's ever asked me that before. Noah Kozlov, Cinesport. Coach, which one of the other three coaches do you go furthest back with, and, and what do you remember most about any of those first interactions with those three? Uh, I, let's see. I was an assistant at Wisconsin from 76 to 84. I think Tom had come in. I don't think Tom was in there. Uh, so he, I think he came like the year after I had gone to Platteville. Um, but I had seen him at some clinics. Uh, John, uh, I knew from watching him work at, uh, at Five Star and uh, when he was younger and he was doing those camps and when I was recruiting for Wisconsin uh, and through clinics and through other things. Um, and Mike, I think uh, we played Army. First time I met him, we played Army in Hawaii in the Rainbow Classic. Uh, for um, the consolation championship and when I was at Wisconsin. And so that's the first time I ever met Mike. So actually it was within probably a five-year period with all of them. And then, of course, we run into each other. We've been on boards together. Tom and I were on the NABC board. Now Cal's on the NABC board uh, that I'm on. Um, Mike's been on these boards, Mike with USA Basketball. So there's so many ways we cross paths, it's hard to, it's hard to say exactly when the, the first was or the furthest back. But that gives you an idea. Back over here. Josh McKinney, WYMT-TV in Hazard, Kentucky. 
having your season end the way it did last year, is there sort of a unfinished business kind of mentality with this year's team, or what's different about this trip compared to last year? Well, first of all, we've never, I've never used the term ended uh, that I can remember to refer to because it's always a process. No matter if you're a senior or whatever, there's always something else in life coming. Um, and you hate to say, oh, we ended with this, or oh, we, if we won the championship, this is how we ended. No, it, it's beginnings. It's, it's, okay, there's other things coming in life. So for a lot of our guys, there's another season coming. So like any other young man, they went to work and said, all right, let's see what we can do next year. So I, I've never brought it up. I don't, I don't coach that way. I've never uh, tried to use poster material or articles to get my guys fired up to play because I always figure this way. If you have to use that kind of motivation to get a team ready to play, what are you going to do? How are you going to top it for the next game? What do you do next? Uh, what other story can you come up with? Um, so I, I, don't, I try to stick with what we have control over at the time. So our last game of the season was a loss in Dallas, happened to be Kentucky. Uh, I'm sure when we played Arizona and Oregon, I, you know, they might have or might not have said whatever. This ended this way or that ended that way. But I try to stay away from talking that way. Oh, right over here. Chris Williamson, uh, WSAW TV. Coach, I had a chance to meet with one of your mentees, uh, John Tharp, today. Could you just talk about that relationship? And he spoke very highly of you, how you haven't changed since the beginning. Could you just talk about your relationship with him? Well, I don't have nearly as much hair when I first met him. I mean, I, I had a lot more then, so he can't say I haven't changed. John Tharp's one of the brightest minds in basketball out there, and not because we're friends and I've talked to him about basketball, because he always liked the way we did things. Um, but I can't remember what number it was, maybe 200 or 300, 100, but we played his team, and if our team won, they were going to do this ball for Coach Ryan's something win. Uh, and jokingly, I think I had said something to him, and they almost beat us. So he didn't listen. It was supposed to be an easier game. Uh, you, you can smile. It's all <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, he knows I'm joking. <laughs> um, his teams always played well, played smart, uh, and I always enjoyed talking basketball with him because he always had some really good questions about angles, about, well, why do you do this? And how, how come you don't do this? And so I always like guys like that. And uh, he's, he's a, a very good coach. Right here in front. Coach Steve Futterman with CBS News. Well, I wanted to ask you, coaches, players, you talk to them all the time. when. And they talk about facing a challenge. We all know what Kentucky has been doing this year. It's been one of the top stories in college basketball. Talk about the challenge you face meeting this Kentucky team and trying to do something that 36 teams have tried but have failed to do. Well, I think we've had a pretty good season also. And um, our, our guys believe that in a 40-minute contest, when they step on the court, that, it, that we can get this. So. Um, when we talk about challenges, we talked about challenges when we played uh, Alabama-Birmingham, UAB, down in uh, Nassau, battle for Atlantis. Because we go over every scouting report the same way. We have a process that we go through. Every team is treated the same. Do you think I have to tell my players that this is a big game or that Kentucky's pretty good? I, they are, and I think our guys are astute enough to figure that part out. But what they know from us is they're going to get this, 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 and this, that we're going to give them some ways that we feel we can be successful if we concentrate more so in this area, this area. The problem is on a lot of teams, the list is like this, and, and, and it's like this for Kentucky. So it, it is a challenge. Right here in the, right here in the middle. Evan Hooper, Indiana Daily Student. Uh, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of public kind of uh, groundswell towards like analytics and hardcore statistics. I'm wondering how much attention, if any, you pay to uh, analytics versus like the eye tests and stuff like that. I, well, I, nobody's ever really defined the eye test, but 
analytics that you take this number, this means this, and how many possessions and that. Uh, I think it's a pretty well-known fact that we've been using points per possession before 99% of the people in the country were using them. I've been using them forever. And points per possession has always been one of the greatest indicators of how good your team is or how poorly you're doing based on the points per possession of the opposition and the points per possession of your team. Now, I had to adjust it when the three-point shot came in, so that tells you how long we've been using it, way before the three-point shot, um, because it is a little higher. For a while there, it was in the 70s, 80s. If you were at one, you won 90-some percent of your games. And if you held your opponents to .9 or below, you would win 90% of your games. So I, I use numbers. Uh, but some of these other numbers that are coming out and other variations and all, that's fine. That's somebody doing what we were doing a long time ago. Uh, but the only one I really pay attention to and practice every day is points per possession. Right here. John Gasway, ESPN. I'm going to use one of those analytics. Uh, in the second half against Arizona, you scored 55 points and 34 possessions against one of the best defenses in the country in a winner go home setting. Is that the best half of offense that you have been connected with at any level as a coach or player? And if not, uh, what team wins that, that title? So it's not true when you saw us do that, that you closed your eyes and said, wait a minute, that's not Wisconsin? You didn't say that? Um, yeah. How about, how about 10 or 12 from three? How about, you know, I would really like to say that that was coaching. Um, that was a couple guys being in a zone We've had teams do it to us, and it's always nice when you can do it to another team. Um, and will that ever be done again that way with threes? Uh, I don't know exactly what Villanova shot. It was like 71% for the game, maybe. Help me out here. Um, but for a half to do what we did, I think our guys uh, are still pinching themselves, but they're enjoying it because Carolina – was playing their best basketball. At, we, we looked at film. I told Roy this. I said, Roy, defensively, your guys were forcing us into some really tough shots. And um, same thing with Arizona, how physical it was both ways. So for us to survive those two, um, we, we had to shoot it pretty well, and we had to take care of the, the fundamentals in order to advance. Because I, I thought both those teams were playing pretty good defense at the end of the year. Right here. Coach, uh, Cal said that Notre Dame's offense was one of the better they faced, and they called your offense probably even better than that. Have, what have you told your team to get past that vaunted Kentucky defense? Well, I would hope that you wouldn't tell my guys that he said that. Um, OK, we've been efficient. I, you know what? what? What you can't do is you can't lie with, with the numbers that our players have put on the board this year for points per possession and everything else. Um, and and I, it, it still is quite amazing. And actually, people help us when they ignore the fact that we can score points because it tells us a lot about the other people who think that we don't. Uh, again, who led the NCAA tournament last year in scoring? It seems like I'm the only one that ever says it. Could, you know why? Because one of my assistants told me. Does anybody know who led the tournament? Wisconsin did, so he was telling me the truth. OK. So uh, when you say he said that we run a pretty good offense, yeah. And you know what? They, they play pretty good defense. <laughs> so you can tell his guys you know, that they've got the best defense we've seen. Back here. Michael Pointer from the Indianapolis Star. Uh, Bo, along the lines of offense, um, any concerns with shooting, with playing in the dome? Mm -hmm. And is there any way you, you try to negate those, in, the impact of that, if any? Last year and this year, especially in Dallas, the shooting background, when we first started our shooting drills, I saw more clanks of, that's misses, and 
than I have ever seen. From, now, a little bit of nerves, a little bit of, um, this one's not quite, Lucas is not quite as deep. Um, you don't actually hear echoes in this one. That was the joke too. Uh, I got it. Thank you. You're with me, Bill. I understand. <laughs> when our guys walked out there last year, not our guys, I walked out there with my high school and college coach. And we're, we're walking out there thinking of the high school days, thinking of our gym, and it totally blew us away. So I know it took a little while to get the guys focused. When we came in here, it's, they've been there before, so it wasn't quite as, as difficult. So actually our shooting this year was better than last year. Still wasn't as good as like when we're at home, but it was better. It is tough. Right here. Coach Ryan, uh, Alec Johnson, National Sports Journalism Center. You've coached uh, many teams throughout, uh, er, uh, throughout your coaching career. What do you think has been the biggest lesson of your coaching career today that you've learned throughout your experience as a coach? Well, two things we always emphasize is how to handle success and how to handle you know, being on the short end of a score. Um, that so many things in their lives for the next 60, 70 years in business, at home, uh, in the community and everything else, there's going to be moments that you're going to have to check what you're going to say next. And through athletics, and have you ever seen one of my guys trash talk? Have you ever seen my guys get technicals? Uh, so, you know, they, but they're not bashful guys. But what we try to teach is life lessons of this is a game, this game is being judged by the guys in striped shirts. They're, they're making the calls. We do our thing. Um, and if we don't like what's going on, we, we, if we take a bump, if we do that, then okay, how can we get better so that we don't take another one? And if we are having success, we always remember. Success has a thousand parents, failure is an orphan. So we try to teach them how to handle when things are going well. Those are the main things that, I mean, obviously there's a lot of other things, but you put me on the spot. Right here. Bo Larry Vault, Danville Advocate Messenger. I know you've known John Calipari for a long time, but it's strictly just from a coaching perspective. What do you respect most about him? Because he just tells it, he's like me, he tells it like it is. Um, if he sees something that, yeah, he, he's real. I, I don't know how else to put it. You know, he's, he's real. I don't know if John trying to use any other agendas to get me. He just does his thing the way he feels is right, and he really doesn't care what other people say if, if, it's right, if he feels that he's doing the right thing, and that's and I'm, I'm the same way. We're going to stop momentarily. We're going to bring the, uh, the first couple of players up, but we're also going to have a special presentation, and I invite Noreen Gillespie of the Associated Press to join us. Noreen? Frank, it's your day. It is his day, Good afternoon, everyone. Before we get started with these gentlemen this afternoon, I'd like to take a moment uh, to hand out the Associated Press's 2015 Player of the Year Award. <laughs> this year's honoree is somebody who we've had a lot of fun watching on the court, but also off the court as well. Whether it's leading Wisconsin to a 35 and three record or rubbing elbows with Will Farrell off the court, it's been a big year for Frank Kaminsky. Let's be serious though, when he's on the court, he's all business. As a sophomore, Kaminsky was averaging just 10 minutes a game. Compare that to this year when he had 18.7 points and eight rebounds per game. His teammates have already jokingly referred to him as P-O-Y throughout the season, and it's my honor this afternoon to make that a reality and hand out the Player of the Year Award. To get things started, I'd like to turn things over to Jim O'Connell, AP's basketball writer. Uh, Frank, everybody talks about, you know, the 
you worry during the season, you don't think about things like an award. Was there a point somewhere during the season where you said to yourself that I'm, I'm going to be, I have a chance of being player of the year, I have a chance of being unanimous first team All-America? Was there somewhere along the way where that entered into your mind? Um, I thought about it a little bit. Um, you know, it wasn't obviously one of my main priorities uh, getting back to the Final Four was, um, you know, it. But to be here and to be honored like this, you know, by AP is, is obviously awesome. Um, you know, I'm very grateful that a lot of people think of me in this manner. Um, you know, I know I got to thank people like Josh and Coach Ryan that, who have helped me along the way. Congratulations. Do pictures with you? Stay out of the way, Josh. <laughs> We're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll bring the rest of the uh, Wisconsin players up and join us here. <laughs> yeah, come on up. Come on up, Michael. We've got Trayvon Jackson, Frank Kaminsky, Josh Gasser, Sam Decker, and Nigel Hayes. All right, we'll continue with the uh, questions straight back here. Please name an affiliation. Dennis Krause, Time Warner Cable Sports Channel in Wisconsin. Coach, several of your key guys are state natives. More than a coincidence? Uh, no, when we recruit, we're looking for guys who want to be at Wisconsin and have the talent and the, and the uh, ability to handle me and uh, some things that I might uh, remind them of now and then. No, they, uh, but Midwest, yeah, Wisconsin's uh, had some really good players. You know, we've gone after a lot of guys from the Midwest. Uh, parents can, family can see the games. A lot of times young men want to stay close to home. Not everybody, but uh, so the idea is to find people who uh, want to be at your place and want to be with your guys and, and play the game and have a chance to go to the NCAA tournament every year. You know, it's uh, every one of these guys that we talked to that was uh, that was sort of in the works, and to have a chance to be here at a at a press conference like this. So, yeah, we've we've had a lot of players from Wisconsin. Right here in front. Uh, hi, Mark Tracy with the New York Times. Uh, everyone except uh, Nigel and Josh, because I already asked them this. I was wondering. I know you fill out on your MetroFit every morning how much sleep you get, stuff like that. I was wondering if you could tell me how much sleep you guys got last night and what you ate most recently. And uh, then, Coach, I was wondering if you could talk a little about what you do with the information you get from them. So that was for each of the players? Uh, well, I, I asked Josh and Nigel that. They okay, can for the rain. Right. So let's <laughs> Trayvon. All right. Okay. Um, I, well, Eric, our second commission coach, usually gets mad at me because I'm not too judicious with uh, filling in my information so I'm not too good at that but I got to get more consistent with it uh, but last night I got about seven and a half eight hours which is not too bad and my last meal probably a burger I think it was a burger and guac <laughs> he's big on guac uh, go ahead Frank I don't really know exactly what time I fell asleep um, probably about seven eight hours um, I had some pretzels <laughs> before we got on the bus um, had an omelet this morning with some ham, salt, and pepper, um, some syrup on top. I know I get a lot of flack for putting syrup on my omelets, but Nigel does it too. It's actually really good. So. Drowns it. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's about it. I had some fruit too. I had some fruit, yeah. So what you had? I had some uh, pancakes, some eggs, and bacon, and I had a good sleep. Okay, and what do you do with that information? And what do I do? First of all, what did you say it was called? 
Metra. Okay, but that's good to know. We, we went out and hired the best strength coach in America two years ago. The best. Love it. They tell him the information. He doesn't tell me anything. He deals with it with the players because he's done so. That's what he does. And no, he, he fills me in on some things. Maybe this guy needs to be encouraged to do this, that type of thing. But I, don't you think this stuff has been working, guys? You're, you're eating better. You're, they, they took cooking classes to cook for themselves. Um, and I certainly know that in the last five minutes of games, I think our guys have looked pretty fresh. Uh, Trey's going to say he looked real fresh because he just got back in the lineup and he hasn't had that many Did minutes yet. But don't you think your teammates yeah. have looked fresh? Yeah, look good. Yeah. He was with the Bulls for a reason. That's right. Yeah. So what I do with it is sometimes without them knowing, I'll maybe do a sidebar with them uh, and say, well, how'd you sleep last night? How do you feel? Like I asked Trey the other day um, after one of his first harder workouts, Trey, how you feeling? Are you sore? So are you getting rest? So that's how I use it. Back in the back. With Josh Trigas uh, from the Journal Sentinel. Josh, last you're shooting much better in postseason play this year than last year. I'm just curious if it's just a typical cycle. Sometimes you get hot, sometimes not, or is it being another year removed from the knee injury that you're just that much healthier? As Zach Bohannon would have said, it's, it's a random sequence of events, so you can't really control it. Um, you know, you work hard, uh, get in the gym a lot to try to make. Uh, make shots and help your team out. So I, I don't know what it is. Obviously, I'm a lot healthier this year. Last year, I was running on nothing at the end of the year. Um, coming back from that injury was tough. Uh, but I definitely feel better this year. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but uh, just trying to help the team. Back here. Uh, for Coach Ryan and also for Sam, I wonder if how much, can, back here, how much Kentucky's length affects your offensive efficiency and the kind of shots that you seek. Go ahead, Sam. Well, obviously their length and size is something we have to scout for and just you know be on the lookout for because they can alter a lot of shots and, and just get up and, and make you know uncontested shots, feel like contested shots. So obviously that's something we're gonna have to work around. But uh, you know we you know, coach preaches you know the pump fakes and all that stuff all the time, and uh, so we just got to play our game, do what we do all year. And um, you know, just attack this game just like we've attacked every other game, and not make it bigger than what it is. And and usually, if we do our things well, we we do all right. Uh, Bo, do you want? Uh, well, I thought about the tennis racket thing, and uh, lot, but you know what? With these guys, they might have started whacking each other with them. So I didn't, you know, the tennis rackets to to be a bigger, longer defender. Uh, but I I, I thought. Uh, no, there's no way I'll do that. It, you can't. So you're trying to say that Riley Deering <laughs> is not Stein? Yeah, come on. It, he was trained. Matt Ferris was. It, we, we can't simulate what they have in practice, so that is difficult. Right here. Jermaine Franklin with TSN um, for Frank and Sam. Can you talk about, I guess, how tough that loss was last year, your attitude going into the game? and how that's different coming into this year with a chance at revenge. Um, last year's loss was obviously very difficult, um, you know, to um, lose in the way we did on a last second shot, um, you know, left a sour taste. Um, you know, it, it was a motivating factor to get back to the stage. You know, it's just luck of the draw that we get to play Kentucky again. Um, and obviously we're gonna do whatever we can to come out on top. Yeah, obviously that was a tough loss to swallow and um, one that was, it was tough to get over just because of you know how special of a season it had been, and you know how close we were to playing for a national title. But we used that kind of as a stepping stone going into the off season. You know what we wanted to do and what we wanted to accomplish. Not necessarily playing Kentucky, but just getting back you know in this position and ha having a chance of 40 minutes to get to a national title. Um, you know, so we're, so we're blessed to be back in this position. Uh, we're not going to use last year's game as what you guys like to call revenge or the rematch, but we just want to. You know, play whoever we got to play and uh, get a win and then uh, go on for another game. We've got time for two more right here in front. Taylor Zarzer, Sirius XM. Frank, was that game against Kentucky motivating factor for you to come back to play 
this season, and Trayvon, uh, Ben Brust was saying it took him a long time to get over that game. Now he looks back and says, what an outstanding season, but it took some time. How long did it take you? And Frank, was it a motivating factor for you to come back? Frank first. Um, yeah, yes and no. Um, I don't think I ever would have left, but um, you know, I, it's obviously motivating because you want to come back to the stage. You know, this is what you know, seasons are remembered for. You know, you remember the national champion at the end of the season. So I just wanted that badly to be us, and I thought we had an opportunity to do so, and now we're back at this stage. Um, we fought hard to get here, and we're going to do whatever we can to make sure um, that we're the last team standing. Trayvon? Yeah, I mean, uh, it was definitely, it took a while to get over it. Um, but for me, um, it was like that first week. I kind of just took some time off to really just reflect on the whole season, not necessarily just that time, just that game. I was more shocked more than anything. I didn't expect to lose. I knew we weren't supposed to lose. Um, but I mean, it's definitely a lot of fun to be back here. That, that had a lot to do with, you know, how hard we worked. And, um, you know, being in this position again, I think this year is a lot easier. So um, it, it was just, you know, looking at it, looking at it all as a whole and um, just, just learning from it. Last question right here. Uh, AJ Rose with the reflector. Uh, Frank, can you just talk a little bit about the challenges that um, facing a tandem such as Willie Cauley Stein and Carl Anthony Towns is for you, you guys? And then the challenges of whenever they get tired, they bring in two other fresh players, in Zachary Johnson and Marcus Lee. Um, it's very difficult um, when you have so much depth and so much height, uh, come, especially coming off the bench, you know, it makes for a good team. Um, it's not going to be easy. Um, you know, they're great shot blockers. They know how to score on offense. They can run the floor. They can defend in multiple positions. So, um, you know, it's kind of like a two-headed monster with their, with their bench and their starters. So it's not going to be easy, but, um, you know, I think we have a team that's willing to do whatever to, we can to make sure we win. We actually have one more question. Coach? Yeah, Nigel, uh, what is that little drill that I caught you doing at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, at the Kohl Center when you didn't know that I was in there with the tennis ball and the basketball? What were you working on? I was just trying to be like Frank, honestly. Uh, and Josh and Trey, they're great ball handlers, and I aspire to be like those guys. Uh, <laughs> uh they're great guys. It's, I, I appreciate you letting me speak. Uh, I don't know why I show up to these things. <laughs> no one talks to me. Nigel, they're afraid to ask you a question anymore. I That's mean, so it. since sticking to tradition, priest did digitation, and hello, Mr. Sonographer. There you go. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick.